Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday Online here at New Life. We are glad you've joined us. If you're new or newish with us, welcome. We would love to have you head on over to our website, that's newlifecollingwood.com. Hit the New Here button in the menu and tell us a little bit about yourself if you're comfortable doing that. We would be privileged to journey with you as you explore faith. Well, we've got lots in store this morning. We're continuing on in our series, Jesus and Politics. We're looking at peacemaking today. Um, and that's a topic that's very close to us in our denomination. So we get to explore that today. We want to spend a little bit of time in worship. And I know I joke all the time that it's probably confusing to hear me say when I don't have guitars and microphones in front of me. Um, but we want to do that. But before we jump into that, um, our virtual lobby is back today after the broadcast. We would love to have you join us over there. All the information that you need to sign in for that conversation and prayer time today is in the video description below. Or or it's in your weekend email if you subscribe to our newsletter. So that'll be right after the service. Great time of conversation, discussion, and prayer together. You are most welcome to join us. We'd be glad to have you there. Uh, we do want to take a little bit of time to begin our morning in worship today. And one of my challenges to myself and to all of us through this past year has been to explore how do we worship? What does it mean to be worshipers when we sort of take away the way that we usually do that? And we've unearthed lots of different things, and I know it's been really helpful and beneficial to me. So I'd like to begin here in this beautiful forest that means so much to me, where I'm just surrounded by the beauty of God's creation, to contemplate that together for a minute. And maybe it's not nature that really charges you up about the power and the creativity of God. I think we're all wired to recognize him somewhere around us. So... I want to read a portion of a psalm for you. And as I do that, think about where it is that you see God, where you're impressed by his power, where you're in awe of him. This is from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. Let's just pray over together that last line for a moment. He commanded it and it stood firm. God, today we want to recognize your power at work around us. And we come to you in our humanness, recognizing that fact in two ways today, I think. We recognize your power and we praise you for it. For me, God, my personal prayer in a place like I'm standing right now is just, I see so much of your creativity at display here and I praise you for it. I am so in awe of it that I just stop and say, God, you are great. But there's also an element there of that standing firm that I think so many of us are craving and desiring and needing in our spirits right now. So God, we say to you, we recognize that you are the God of the firm foundation. You we can stand upon and know that we are on sure and safe ground. And we give you our praise at the beginning of this morning together for that as well. And we pray that together in your name. Amen. I also want to read the ending portion of Psalm 33 for you. And we'll worship through that as well. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, as we put our hope in you. Would you allow me the privilege of praying 
for you for a moment. Father, I want to pray over my sisters and brothers in this wonderful New Life family. Here we are in April of 2021. We are now over a year into a difficult experience. And I want to pray encouragement over our New Life family. I want to pray peace over each one. I would just love for each person listening this morning to know the sureness of your unfailing love with them in a personal and close way. God, as we begin our morning together, I pray that your spirit would be at work in each life, in each heart, each mind, each spirit that's listening and watching right now, that we would know the sureness of the hope we have in you. God, we love you. We worship you together at the beginning of this day for you are worthy of our worship and we offer it gratefully. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, New Life family. My name is Christine. And I'm Jason. And we've been attending New Life for about six and a half years with our four kiddos. We've got Owen and Leah, who are junior youth age, and we've got Anna and Melanie, who are little ones. And Jason and I, for a couple of years before um, we couldn't meet in person anymore, we were teaching in the toddler room. So if there's any little toddlers or kindergartens this morning watching the service with their parents or grandparents, we just want to say, hey guys, we yeah. miss you, and we hope that we can see you soon. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke. It's from chapter 6, beginning at verse 32. So I'll give you a moment if you'd like to follow along. You can find that in your Bible. And then Jason will do our reading for us. Okay, Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now I'll lead us in a moment of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we can gather and worship you in this way, that we can listen to your words that are a great reminder of how we're supposed to be treating all of those around us. I just want to pray at this time uh, for those out there who are, who are lonely, who are angry and hurt. Uh, there are many people that we might not agree with or might have difficulty with, and this is a great reminder of how we need to treat them and to show love to them. And I know there are people out there who are hurting, Lord, and I hope that others will reach out to them and show them your love so that they can experience the fullness that you um, have for them. And just pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, New Life family. We hope you have a great morning. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hi friends, welcome back. We're glad that you're able to join us again this week as we are uh, in the middle of our series, Jesus in Politics. And of course, we've looked at Jesus in power and how that relates to the idea of Palm Sunday uh, in the biblical story. And then last week we celebrated Easter and we looked at this idea of Jesus in truth. So today we want to look at the peace politics of Jesus. And I want to talk about this idea of order and chaos. So if you are um, 
anything like me, uh, you have a certain way that you like to do things. So if I were to say to you, what are the first things you do when you wake up in the morning? Describe the first five minutes. In fact, I would just encourage you to do that with each other now, whoever's with you. Just quickly go through. I do this, 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 and go ahead, have a shot at that. Okay, you probably do the same thing every day in the same order because there's something in us that longs for, craves for order. And one of the ways that the pandemic has been messing with our minds for the last year is that it has disrupted the order that we have become so accustomed to. Interestingly, the biblical story or the, and the, the authors of scripture actually spend quite a bit of time talking about chaos and order. And it's a theme that runs through the scriptures uh, quite prevalently if you are looking for it. <clears throat> and I want to give you a few examples of how part of what God is doing in our world is combating chaos and establishing order, and then inviting us to participate with him in the establishing of that order. And some of these thoughts I'm borrowing from, uh, from a scholar named Walter Brueggemann, who has uh, shaped some of my thinking on this. But I, I want to walk you through the scriptures a little bit with this idea of chaos. So in, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 2, you read that the earth was without form and void. <clears throat> Sometimes we think of um, before creation, there was nothing. But this idea of without form and void is a word that can be translated as chaos in the scriptures. In Genesis 7, with the flood account, when it talks about the waters rising above the mountains, that's this concept of chaos, chaos prevailing. <clears throat> in Isaiah 27, this is what God says through the prophet Isaiah, In that day the Lord will punish the Leviathan. And the Leviathan, as much as people want to debate, is it a dinosaur? What was the Leviathan? In ancient Near Eastern literature, Leviathan was a depiction of the forces of chaos at work. And so here's Isaiah saying, in language that the people of that time would fully understand, God would put chaos in its place. In Isaiah 34, God will measure the land for chaos, and it will be called the land of nothing. And you see this theme happening throughout the Old Testament, but then to tie into last week and what we experienced, when Jesus died on the cross in Matthew 27, we read that at noon, darkness fell across the whole land. That whole idea of darkness being on the land is a depiction of chaos. And it was as if, for a moment, it looked as if chaos had won. But the cross would triumph over that. And what you see in the, in the biblical authors is the idea of God overcoming chaos through His means rather than through our means. So the creation story is about creation um, as a means of overcoming chaos. It, you know, we think of what was there before creation, and we tend to think about um, nothing. There was nothing before creation, but the ancients thought about chaos as preceding creation. And so creation is God's way of putting chaos in its place and establishing order. The very thing that we want, the cross and the empty tomb, are depictions of what, of what Jesus accomplished in overcoming chaos in all of its forms. And you, of course, in Colossians, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus triumphed over the powers and authorities and disarmed them through the cross. That's this idea of God overcoming chaos. And of course, in the scriptures, particularly in what Jesus calls us to and what we see the early church doing, so in places like Matthew 10, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses to kings and all those in authority. And in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses. And it's Jesus inviting us into this idea of recognizing that God has established order in our world. It's not that there is no order. 
So Brueggemann would say that order is a gift for us, but then there's also the task of establishing and maintaining order that God invites us into to partner with him. Here's the difficulty, though. We often see ourselves as the only means to overcoming chaos and establishing order. And this is where politics comes into play. Because we forget that there's a God who created this world, and that God is not going to let this world be unmade. But how often do we either as individuals or communities or nations forget that there's a God that has given us the gift of order and we take it upon ourselves to establish order. And when we begin to forget God and we take it upon ourselves to establish order, we create systems to, uh, to allow us to have the kind of order that we want. The problem is the systems that we create are often more about self-preservation. They're more about inclusion of some and the exclusion of others. And then they create injustices and oppression and exclusion for some so that others uh, can be comfortable and can benefit. And this happens nationally, uh, federally. It happens uh, in a community and it happens individually. And it even happens uh, in our churches. And so Brueggemann would say, if there is no order but the one we make, then all things are possible. And we know the scary reality of that because we see it at work often in forms of, of violence and in forms of chaos, all in the name of maintaining order as some people have deemed it. And yet that order is more often than not, particularly politically, that order is more often about self-preservation and about votes than it is about the welfare of the people. And you see, one of the ways that the biblical writers talk about order as opposed to chaos is they use this term of peace, shalom, overall well-being. But often in the church, when we have talked about peace, what we've talked about is, is about personal peace. We've tied peace to the concept of personal sin and guilt and forgiveness. And we've talked about this good news of, of Jesus forgiving our sin and removing our guilt and us being forgiven, but it's all on an individual basis. And we have very little to offer in the, in the concept of, of order and peace overcoming the chaos in our world that bothers us so much. And then we have little to offer in addressing the systems that we've created to maintain order, which are really just chaos in disguise. Because any time that some are put down, that some are marginalized, that some are oppressed, that some experience injustice so that others can have the kind of world that they want, that's chaos. And the good news of the gospel goes so much further than just our individual forgiveness or, or just my own sin being dealt with. That Jesus in the Easter story is about God uh, and the politics of peace overcoming chaos. And so into the mix of all this is the reading that we've had done for us this morning from, from the McDonald's. And that's in, in Luke 6 where Jesus comes and he begins to turn the cart completely upside down. And he begins to talk about things that catch us off guard. And he, and he hits uh, one of the, the main pillars of the systems of order that we tend to create in our world. And he hits it full on as a means of, of pointing out to us how poorly that pillar stands, how poorly that system works. And that is this idea of reciprocity. And, and we have talked about this before. If you want to hear another sermon on this very um, passage, then you can go back and look in our archives on a sermon that I did on Jesus and enemies. But in this passage, Jesus hits the, the concept of reciprocity as one of the tools we've used to create a system of order that really is just chaos in disguise. Because he says this, listen, you love people who love you. Well, good for you. 
Even sinners do that. Even bad people do that. Anybody can do that. It's easy to love people who love you. Or he says, you do good to people who will do good to you. Well, anybody can do that. And you'll lend to people who you know are going to pay you back. Well, what good is that? What reward are you going to get for that? So Jesus talks about uh, stopping or not doing what we've always done. And if we're honest, most of us are very comfortable with this idea of, of reciprocity because it works. I mean, it, for the most part, um, we feel good about the systems that we're a part of. So you have friend groups of people that are just like you, that you get along with, and you are part of community groups that, that function with this idea of reciprocity. Our, our governmental systems are set up this way. That if you do good, good things will be done for you. If you are nice to people, then people are going to be nice back to you. And we know that this is part of the reality of life. So it's not as if Jesus is saying this is completely defunct and void. But I think what he calls his followers to is something far beyond this. So he he's going through this idea of... of turning the table upside down. And he is saying, if you want to establish peace, if you want to have the kind of order that you long for, if you want to see chaos held at bay or even pushed back, what you think has been the way to do it has only been leading to more chaos. And now I want you to experience something different. So he begins by saying, don't do what you've always been doing. And then then he says, now here's what I want you to do. Love your enemies. So here we are at verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. And that is a concept that is so foreign. And this isn't just about you and your personal enemies. I believe that Jesus is giving us a a new system that can be applied for you as an individual, for communal groups, for national levels and global concepts. There is so much evidence of the law of reciprocity at work in this world only working to, to actually maintain and at times even increase the chaos in our world. Because it's far too easy to only be nice to those who are nice to us, to only love those who are going to love us, to only lend to those that we know can pay us back. And what you find in Jesus and and throughout um, the the followers of Jesus and the writings that they did is that uh, he's calling us to something radically different that goes way beyond this idea of reciprocity. In fact, it just turns it upside down on its head. And he invites us to the impossible, to the unthinkable, to love those who aren't going to love you back, to be good, to do good to those who are never going to repay that, to lend to those who are not going to pay you back. And of course, this isn't an exhaustive list. He is giving us a principle by which to live. And he's saying, this is what love looks like. And then he says, here's the reward you get from it. You will be acting as children of the Most High because God's kind to the unthankful and the wicked. You need to be compassionate like your father is compassionate. So here's Jesus you know, saying, in the church, if all we're going to do is talk about personal peace, then, then we don't have much to offer. Jesus is giving us a model for peace that works at all levels. He is giving us the opportunity to trust Him and to follow Him and to be His children. You know, children look just like their parents. For the most part, you can tell a a child and a parent because they look so much alike. Children mimic what they see their parents modeling. And any of us who have been around little kids know all too well how true that is, that they mimic what they see. 
You know that expression, every time I open my mouth, I hear my father speaking or I hear my mother speaking. Um, Children are images of their parents. And here's Jesus saying, if you want to show the world what God is up to and what he is like, let me invite you into this way of living. This is the politics of peace that Jesus is inviting us into. It's the politics of peace that hits chaos head on. And it overcomes chaos. Not just at the personal level. Not just at the neighborhood level. But even globally. And it's an invitation that he is giving to us in this passage. What he's calling his followers to. And I think Jesus is saying this is the best way to overcome chaos. We long for order. We crave for it. And it's what we need. And when our world gets turned upside down, for so many, instinctively, we want to um, circle the wagons and create systems where we feel safe and secure and comfortable. The problem is when we do that and we've forgotten about a God who has already established order in this world and given it to us as a gift and then invites us to participate with him in establishing order, which means that we're combating chaos. When we forget about that, then we take matters into our own hands and we end up creating those systems that are really just chaos in disguise because it's only good for some. And so when it comes to the good news of peace or the politics of peace that Jesus offers, I would like to suggest this, that we take him seriously and what he is saying in passages like this and the way that he modeled peace for us. Because if the only good news we have for people is interpersonal peace that Jesus offers in peace with God, and if we have nothing to say about how Jesus answers a global need for peace in this world, for order, that if we cannot show people and explain to people how the politics of peace of Jesus can overcome chaos in our world, then we really have nothing to offer them. Either Jesus and his way and the gospel of peace is the best way to establish global peace or else Jesus has nothing really much to offer. And so I think part of what we must do with him and his teaching in passages like this is to take him seriously and to trust him and that's That's the the litmus test. How far will we trust Jesus in relation to this when it seems to be so counterproductive to what we see happening in our world? And yet the evidence is there that the way we've been going about it for thousands of years has not been working. The systems of order we've created are merely um, maintaining chaos in various forms. It, It creates some order, but it's limited and it's not for everyone And the way of Jesus is is this kind of way that we read in Luke 6 and in other places is opening the door for us to embrace and live out the politics of peace according to Jesus and to show the world that this really is good news. And so we need to decide if we'll take him seriously. And then we need to spend the time talking about how are we going to, to live this out? Where is there chaos in in not only the world where we can be involved globally, but even in our neighborhoods, where we can be involved through nonviolent means, where we can practice the, the politics of peace, but we are still confronting chaos. We are still confronting violence. We are still confronting injustice, but we are doing it through the way of Jesus rather than through the systems that we've created so that we can have the kind of order that we think is best. And what Jesus invites us into is the order that God wants for everyone, not just for some of us. So I want to leave you with that to think about how will we take him seriously? What kind of conversations do we need to have about about confronting chaos that we see in our neighborhoods 
and in our province, in our nation, and globally. I want to ask you to do one more thing. In the video description below, there is um, there's a, a URL for Poll Everywhere, and it's a simple little poll, one question poll, but I'd love it if you'd click that link and answer it. And we're, we're going to give you two links. One is to click the link and answer uh, the, the multiple choice question and then the other one will actually show you the results of that and we'll leave it open for a week and you can check back later in the week to see how people answer this question and it's really just around the idea of, of how convinced you are that what Jesus offers here is the best way to combat chaos and violence and injustice in our world. If you do that we'd appreciate it. Uh, it'll take you 10 seconds to do it. And, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how we all answer that. So we're not, there's, it's all anonymous, so no one's checking up on you. We just want to know where you're at in relation to this, to this topic. Thanks for following along today and uh, look forward to, uh, to next week carrying on in this series um, of Jesus and politics. So until then, um, we trust that uh, this week will be uh, one that is full of peace and order for yourself as you walk with Jesus. Um, day by day. Bye for now.